Good evening, HPC family. Thanks for tuning in once again. <clears throat> this evening, we're going to continue our look at Mark chapter 15. Yesterday, we looked at the first five verses, and this evening, we're going to look at verses 6 through 15. But I want us to think for a moment of really what's going on. Um, all of us are, are going through this burden and this sad reality together. Uh, what we currently face, um, we shouldn't allow that to distract our minds from the overwhelming joy that we have in Christ. Really, this present bold reminder of our frail world should drive us to the sure and steady anchor of our soul, our resurrected Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. The current situation doesn't overshadow the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords who rules over all things, even this moment in history. So it's my hope this week in our time together to draw our hearts closer towards our Savior in his final hours before his crucifixion. And again, to that end, let's turn to Mark chapter 15 once again. And as you turn, I'm going to have a word of prayer for our time. Father, we thank you so much for the privilege of being able to come around your word, to be able to look at this passage to see more about what you have done in the past to secure our future in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, tune our hearts and our minds to your word. Help us to focus on you. Help us to focus on the things you've done for us and your overwhelming love for us that you've demonstrated in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, in his final hours. Again, we ask that you'd be glorified and that we would be blessed. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. So again... Yesterday, we looked at Mark chapter 15, verses 1 through 5 briefly. And just to, to summarize for us this evening, one of the key things we looked at and needed to understand is that the Jews had, had made up their mind by this point. They wanted Jesus dead. In fact, this is something they'd wanted for some time. The religious leaders, the scribes, the chief priests, the Pharisees, all of them had it out for Jesus. And the issue was that the Jewish leadership, though they had convicted Jesus of, of crimes, which in fact they hadn't, but though they'd done this and they thought he deserved death, they couldn't carry out that sentence. They didn't have the power and authority to do that. So they needed Rome. They needed the hand of Rome to do that. And the person that fit that bill was Pilate. Pilate falls or finds himself into this unique situation <clears throat> to help the Jewish leadership, to help those religious scribes and um, chief priests to, to put Jesus to death. And it's, a, it's an odd relationship because the Jews and Pilate were in the constant tug and war of who's in charge and who's in control. Pilate had not done well in dealing with the Jews up to this point. Um, he, he'd done some things that created lots of tension, and the higher-up powers in Rome, to include Caesar, looked down, and, and he was not sitting in uh, good favor with Rome, nor was he really sitting in good favor with the Jews. And that's all kind of comes to a boiling point in our present passage uh, this evening. But we're going to look at verses 6 through 15, and so I'm just going to read uh, the passage for us quickly, and then we'll dive into the text itself. Mark chapter 15, beginning in verse 6. Now at the feast, he used to release from them one prisoner for whom they asked. And among the rebels in prison who had committed murder in the insurrection, there was a man called Barabbas. And the crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do as he usually did for them. And he answered them, saying, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he perceived that it was out of envy that the chief priests had delivered him up. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to ha have him release for them Barabbas instead. And Pilate again said to them, Then what shall I do with the man you call the king of Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him. And, the, and Pilate said to them, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. And it's that text that we're going to look at uh, in these next few moments. But verses 6 and 7, to kind of outline it, verses 6 and 7 give us the setting. And then the rest of the text really flows or operates out or around these three questions that Pilate asks his audience. So let's take a look at the setting, verses 6 and 7. First off, we see that Pilate is, is 
engaged in this customary act of, of official pardoning or amnesty in which he releases someone to gain favor with, with the people, right? He's got to do what he can to keep the, the, the favor of the people. And in this instance, um, something he'd done, at least at this feast, historically or other feasts perhaps, was to release somebody from prison. And Pilate really is hoping that this custom will solve his problem, the problem of Jesus' innocence and the Jewish leader's hatred for him. And so Pilate appeals to this custom in hopes that it will get him out of the hot water that he finds himself in. And verse 7 is also part of this setting or this context, because in it we're introduced into, we introduce into the, the narrative a new character, Barabbas. In verse 7, we see that Barabbas is introduced as somebody who is already in prison, somebody who had participated in an insurrection or an uprising against Rome and its powers, uh, local, local authorities, and that he was in fact guilt, guilty of murder or at least being associated with those who had carried out murder. Uh, in other passages, we, we find out that he is also um, guilty of, uh, of stealing as well. So all that to say is the, the man Barabbas was in fact guilty. Uh, he, he, was an, he was a guilty man. He deserved to be there. And, and keep that in the back of our minds because Barabbas plays a part in this, although it seems to be fairly passive. But in contrast, the guilty, in, in, in contrast to the innocence of Jesus. Okay, so uh, again, Barabbas was probably the, the leader of this insurrection that had recently taken place. And some, for some reason, uh, Pilate ends up letting him go, again, in order to pacify the crowd. But this question, the first question that Pilate asks, we see in verses 8 and 11 and how that plays out. The first question that he's really getting at is, should I release Jesus? Should I let the king of the Jews go? And this is important for us to see all that's being, all that's being drawn out here. Verse 8 tells us that the Jews had gathered around Pilate's home or Pilate's palace in preparation for this custom. They knew about this and what was going on. And this could have still been fairly early in the morning or fairly early in the day. But this crowd, this large crowd has gathered to cast their vote as to who would be released. And up until this point, we don't really have any idea who's at play here. Is it Jesus? Is it Barabbas? It's just all of this is context and setting. But verse 9 is where Pilate poses this powerful question, this first powerful question. Look with me at the text, Mark chapter 15, verse 9. And he answered them, that is, Pilate answered the crowd, saying, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? You see, Pilate knows that Jesus is innocent. Earlier on in, in the flow of time, uh, Pilate had, had questioned Jesus prior to this, and he couldn't find anything that would make him guilty or be able to hold him guilty for. So he sent him to Herod, Antipas, the son of Herod the Great, in hopes that Herod would be able to kind of wash or solve his problems so that Pilate could wash his hands. But Pilate, or excuse me, Herod, saw him as innocent as well, even though there were large crowds there uh, bringing up false charges and accusations. Pilate knew that Jesus was innocent. Imagine, again, this Roman governor who was really not a kind man. He knew that Jesus was innocent. Pilate had a strong sense of justice. I mean, as, a, as the governor, he had, to be, he had to have justice. He had to enact justice in order to maintain control and power in order to appease and carry out his duties as the governor uh, underneath, underneath the thumb of Rome, underneath the power of Rome. And so Pilate's sense of justice wanted to let him go, but the pressure from the Jews was weighing in and pressing down upon him. And in this appeal, and in these several appeals to the crowd, perhaps Pilate is hoping to find some kind of sympathy, some kind of hearing with the crowd that maybe would help him solve his problem of the innocence of Jesus and the hatred of the scribes. And we also see in verse 10, Pilate was keenly aware of, of, of the hearts and minds of these religious leaders. Look with me at verse 10. It says, For he, Pilate, perceived that it was out of envy that the chief priests had delivered him up. You see, Pilate knew what was going on behind the scenes. He knew the motives of the chief priests. He knew that their heart was full of envy and jealousy. In fact, it was that envy and jealousy that ruled those religious leaders as opposed to the, the, the commands of God and the law of God, it was their own sinful hearts that had brought them to this place. 
the, the chief priests and scribes, they were those who were to represent God, yet their hearts were bowed to their own agenda to kill Jesus. Earlier on in Mark's gospel, um, we see uh, several aspects or allusions to this. Mark chapter 11, verse 18, it says this, And the chief priests and the scribes heard it, that is his teaching, and the chief priests heard it, and the chief priests and the scribes heard it, and were seeking a way to destroy him, for they feared him, because all the crowd was astonished at his teaching. You see, the chief priests and the scribes knew that Jesus had authority and power when he teached. He, they knew that he had the ability to speak to God's people, and they desired to listen. Consider what Mark tells us in Mark chapter 12. Again, Jesus has just been speaking. And now here's the response. And they were seeking to arrest him, but feared the people, for they perceived that he had told the parable against them. So they left him and went away. You see, they were afraid, the religious leaders were afraid of Jesus, because he was a threat to their power. He was a threat to their prestige. He was a threat to their way of living. He was a threat to what they wanted most. And so all along in this gospel narrative, they have been deciding and figuring out how can they get rid of Jesus, and the moment has finally come. And so, again, Pilate has asked, what do you want me to do with Jesus? And their answer we find in verse 11. Mark chapter 15, verse 11 says this, But the chief priest stirred up the crowd to have him release Barabbas instead. The chief priests... And these religious leaders capitalize on Pilate's hopes to use this amnesty against them. They flip it on its head and they ask for Barabbas, this man who is in prison, guilty of murder, guilty of robbery, guilty of insurrection, and yet they cry out for him to be released. Now, in some sense, Barabbas might have been somewhat of a local hero because he represented the opposing force to Roman, Roman, Roman oppression. He represented some kind of hope that, um, that maybe they could get away from Rome. And again, Jesus, the messianic expectations for Jesus were very much wrapped around the idea that he would deliver his people from Rome. So the leaders carried away by envy, they manipulate the crowd, they ask for, they ask for Barabbas to be set free, this guilty man to be set free. Because the reality of this scenario is, at least humanly speaking, is whoever controls this crowd controlled the outcome of the day. Again, they ask for the guilty to be set free so that the innocent can suffer. In doing this, they're making themselves guilty before God and placing God's judgment upon themselves. Consider what Proverbs chapter 17 verse 15 says, He who justifies the wicked and he who condemns the righteous are both alike an abomination to the Lord. The stark contrast of justifying the wicked and condemning the righteous stand in, in, in bold face print in our text as we, as we read this in Mark chapter 15. They are justifying the wicked. They're saying, release Barabbas, who is guilty. And we want to condemn Jesus, who is righteous in the process. And the people who do that, as Proverbs seventeen fifteen says, are an abomination to the Lord. They've placed themselves under God's judgment. So, Pilate is doing what he can to pacify the people. And the leaders are doing what they can to incite the crowd against Jesus. Now we come to the next question that, that Pilate poses. And I think this is a very perceptive and pertinent question for everything that's going on um, in the passage and in our lives at any point in time. Look with me at verse 12. And Pilate again said to them, Then what shall I do with the man you call the king of the Jews? You see, Pilate puts it back onto the religious leaders. After all, they're the ones who have ironically charged Jesus with being their king. And the only reasonable response from Rome, if there's an uprising where there's a king that challenges Caesar's authority, is, in fact, that he be crucified. So, again, Pilate turns it back to the crowd, Pilate turns it back to those religious leaders and says, look, you're the ones that say he's king. I'm not saying that. So in a way, there's this weird irony taking place as all, as the, as all of this happens. Again, Pilate knows that Jesus is innocent. 
He's trying to reason with the crowd once again to appeal to, to the logic of what's going on, that Jesus is not worthy or uh, is not worthy of death. He's not worthy of crucifixion. Again, I think there's a small part that play a part in play here that Pilate feels if he can appeal to the people in the crowd, perhaps those who only a few days earlier were on, on that Sunday morning as Jesus entered into Jerusalem crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David, Hosanna in the highest. Those are the people that Pilate wants to appease appeal to. Now, I don't think the entire crowd was made up of those who were there Sunday morning, but certainly there were some in that crowd that had uttered those words. And I think Pilate is trying to capitalize on that audience again, because whoever controls that crowd controls the outcome, at least humanly speaking. And again, this question is perceptive. What shall I do with the man you call the king of Jews? We could boil that down into, into our day. What will you do with Jesus? You see, that question at its base, as it, at its root, is going to have to be answered by everyone at some point in time and in space. What will you do with Jesus? Keep that in your mind as we go on throughout the passage. So Pilate again asks the question, and we again see the response of the crowd. Look with me at verse 13. And they cried out again, Crucify him. The crowd includes the chief priests and the scribes and all those else who had gathered to, for this, this, uh, this day of amnesty. And the demands that they make are only fit for somebody who is going to overthrow Caesar. They cry out yet again, crucify him. There is so much at play here. Again, if Pilate finds him guilty of this, it's reasonable and right, at least in their system, that he be crucified. But Pilate isn't convinced. The religious leaders are, are manipulating and controlling the crowd. They want blood. There is rage, uh, the red of rage, all over this crowd. John's Gospel, in fact, gives us a little insight into maybe some of the tactics they were using. In John's Gospel, in John chapter 19, they say this, If you release this man, being Jesus, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a friend of a king opposes Caesar. In other words, this crowd and these religious leaders are saying, Look, if you don't crucify Jesus, we'll make sure that Caesar understands that you've befriended this insurrectionist, this Jesus figure who has threatened Rome. It's amazing what happens to the human heart when it's pressed like this. The Jews are so blind, they want so badly for Jesus to die that they're willing to befriend and join hands with their enemies in order for this to take place. It's really a sad reality. It's really a sad truth. And in this, Pilate has no chips left. Uh, he was afraid of the crowd because they leveraged his fear of failing Rome. Uh, again, something that has happened in the past. And so, again, Pilate asks another question. One last ditch effort in hopes to alleviate this situation or to reduce this situation, uh, reduce the intensity of this situation. Look with me at Mark chapter 15, verse 14. And Pilate said to them, why? What evil has he done? Again, Pilate says he is innocent. In Luke's account, somewhere in this time frame, Pilate states that he's done nothing wrong. He says that he's done nothing wrong, but I'll punish him anyway in hopes to make you happy. Again, Pilate knows the innocence of Jesus. He's declared it a number of times. But the murderous cry rings out in their response. Crucify him. All the more they cry out, crucify him. The crowd, the religious leaders, are dead set on Jesus' death. And with this, what happens next can only be seen for the greatest miscarriage of justice that it truly indeed is. Because what happens next is Pilate hands him over to be crucified. And it's easy to see or easy to think, and all that's taken place thus far is, is where is God in all of this? Because if you notice in this passage, at least up to this point, 
Jesus hasn't figured into the narrative. He's not an active participant, at least from the human side of things. But lo and behold, there's actually quite a bit of divine involvement that's going on. Uh, of all of this human involvement, we see that God's plan is still being worked out. Remember that Jesus already knows this is going to happen. Again, three times, we looked at this yesterday, three times in Mark's gospel, Jesus points to this, this point, this hour, this point in time, and he's taught the disciples this very thing. Consider what Jesus says in Mark chapter 10, verses 33 and 34. See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles. And they will mock him, and spit on him, and flog him, and kill him. And after three days he will rise. You see, what is happening is, is known by Jesus, and it's fulfilling what Jesus and the Father's plan has been all along. Jesus knew he would be delivered to the chief priests and scribes. He knew they would condemn him to death. He knew that they would deliver him over to the Gentiles, or deliver him over to Pilate. And he knew what was to follow after they were he was delivered to the Gentiles. And so, with all this, Pilate desires to please the crowd. Look at verse 15. Such a sad, sad phrase that captures what's going on. So, Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. It's with the cry of the crowd that Pilate placates them, and in so doing, Pilate releases the guilty and puts the innocent in his place. The process of crucifixion begins with this violent flogging. This act in which these cords or these whips with long strips of leather and bone and metal and other hard objects were woven or strapped into there so that when they would whip the prisoner, it would rip and tear the flesh. And this this flogging, this whipping, this scourging, in fact, was designed to not only create pain and torment, but to, to weaken the body so that the crucifixion wouldn't take as long as it could. Someone could hang on the crucifix for a long period of time, but this idea of flogging was to reduce the amount of time that those prisoners would be on that cross. And again, this points us back to the prophet Isaiah, who wrote hundreds of years before, and consider what he says in his prophecy. In Isaiah 53, Isaiah says this, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried away our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. And all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And in light of all this, this passage from Isaiah points us to the reality that Jesus suffered for our sins. Jesus suffered for our transgressions. The iniquity of our guilt was laid, our guilt was laid upon him. So we must go back to Pilate's question, what shall I do with the man you call the king of the Jews? What will you do with Jesus? Consider in closing this quote from C.S. Lewis. And he's talking about Jesus here. Either this man, Jesus, was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. You see, the default of our world is to like Jesus, is to think he was a great teacher, he was a nice person. And those things are true, but that's not only what's true about him, because he makes bold declarations in the gospel and in his life that he is, in fact, the Son of God, that he, in fact, did come to pay the penalty for humanity's sin, that he came to bore the wrath that we, that we deserved in our place. Jesus is the substitute for sinners. For those who trust in Christ's work on the cross, they can find freedom and forgiveness from sin.
And that's what we're talking about in this Passion Week. That's why Mark is making such a big deal about all these things that are taking place. The innocence of Jesus and the place of the guilty. So again, what will you do with Jesus? Let's pray. Father, again, we thank you for our time together this evening. I pray that you would, again, draw our hearts and minds deeper and deeper into this passage as we reflect upon it throughout the rest of this week. Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ and sending your Son because of your love for us, for us as sinners, and that in him we might have forgiveness of sins. Father, thank you for your grace and your mercy as evidenced in this passage, in this moment in history. We ask that you would guide and direct us the rest of this week. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.